This is Liberty Law Talk, part of Liberty Fund's online library of law and liberty. Your host is Liberty Fund fellow Richard Reinch. Our web address is libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org. Hello and welcome to Liberty Law Talk. I'm your host, Richard Reinch. Today we are discussing with Daniel Mahoney the social economic and political thought of Pope Francis, and if we're naughty, maybe we'll talk about his theology. Daniel Mahoney is the professor of the Augustan Chair, uh, holds the Augustan Chair in Distinguished Scholarship at Assumption College. I'll mention two of his most recent publications. He's written and edited numerous books, The Conservative Foundations of the Liberal Order, and The Other Solzhenitsyn, Telling the Truth About a Misunderstood Writer and Thinker. Daniel Mahoney, glad to have you back on the program. Last you were with us, you were actually discussing uh, the other Solzhenitsyn with us. That's right. And happy to be back. All right. So, Dan, you've been writing uh, and speaking uh, recently about Pope Francis um, and about, uh, you know, his encyclicals and really giving them sort of, um, you know, partial uh, praise, partial criticism, noting where he's in line with the great tradition of Catholic social thought and where he tends to fall out uh, with it. So, you know, maybe uh, I'll just ask a, a basic question here at the beginning. Um, who is Pope Francis? Uh, how, how should we think about him? Well, Pope Francis is very much a third world pope. He, um, I heard George Weigel recently give a talk at College of the Holy Cross where he commented on the provinciality of, of uh, Pope Francis when it comes to socioeconomic, cultural, political things. I think it's fair to say that Pope Francis is deeply marked by the Argentinian experience. The Economist, in an editorial two summers ago, referred to him, I think, quite aptly as a left-wing Peronist. So he's deeply attracted to populist politics and economics, uh, even if paradoxically he doesn't like European and North American populism, uh, for reasons I could explain later. But um, he seems to have been intellectually formed uh, in the 60s and 70s um, in a manner that uh, did not leave him, I think, deeply marked by the full riches of the tradition. Um, I remember when Pope Francis was elected, there were some news reports that Francis was uh, a critic in Argentina in the 70s and 80s of liberation theology, and I think that turned out to be false. Uh, Francis was certainly sensitive to the capacity of liberation theologian, especially in its most political and violent and virulent currents to sow havoc in the church. On the other hand, I think one might describe him as a, a kind of soft liberationist he sees uh, capitalism as simply a source of misery, exploitation, imperialism. Uh, while not exactly friendly to Marxism, he clearly believes that the West is the specific source of injustice, of power, of exploitation in the contemporary world. So let's talk about, let's talk about the, something you say in your recent paper on Pope Francis is sort of the Argentinian experience and how that has shaped him and, and also specifically uh, Peronism. Talk about that's that right. maybe, talk about that maybe more in depth because I think that's also a key not just to his social political thought but maybe even the way in which he regards the church itself uh, and, and his role in sure. the church as the We have to remember uh, Juan Perón, who and Evita Perón, who gave voice and political expression to Peron, Peronism, came out of an authoritarian current in Latin American politics that owed something to fascism. Of course, Peronism continued after 1945, and Perón moved in a more socialist as opposed to fascist direction after the end of the Second World War. But Peronism combined political authoritarianism with a 
quasi-demagogic rhetoric about the priority of the poor. Um, of course, uh, you know, as Michael Novak once said about uh, the, the Peronist who's our Pope, um, he seems to genuinely care for the poor, but he doesn't endorse programs or policies or broad philosophical and theological approaches that would actually help the poor. And I think that's always been the problem with Peronism. One, it's contempt for political liberty and constitutionalism. B, it's um, failure to think res responsibly about the best ways of lifting the poor out of their misery and making them full citizen participants in a regime of liberty. So uh, in 1930, uh, Argentina had had prospects for rivaling Australia as a, uh, it had a large middle class, it had certain political and economic so, potentialities. It's only one, of, uh, one but, of the wealthiest nations in the world. One I mean. of the nations, one of the wealthiest nations in Latin America and in the developing world, and that promise has been abandoned. You can see, for example, the present Pope's um, positive hostility to the government of President Morsi. Morsi, who's an honest man, who has broken the control that the Kirchners, who were populist demagogues, friendly to, ideologically close to, and friendly to the Castro dictatorship in Cuba, um, he, uh, the Pope has, has been stone cold in his attitude to Morsi, because Morsi has, among other things, tried to bring some discipline to the budget process in Argentina, he doesn't engage in the same dem kind of demagoguery about the poor, but as the former mayor of Buenos Aires, he does support generous social welfare programs. But, um, you know, uh, this pope doesn't seem to care all that much about political liberty. And I think it's fair to say, and I, 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 when I'm speaking here, I'm more on his. Uh, uh, occasional statements and his official documents, but and, and this pope has showed a remarkable lack of discipline when it comes to opining mm -hmm. about yes. the church and the world. But uh, in his day-to-day -day commentary, he never expresses genuine support for liberal institutions, whether they're threatened in Venezuela, whether they were threatened by the Kirchners in Argentina. Um, he announced to the world that he was grieving on the death of the tyrant in Cuba when Castro died recently. He was absolutely silent about the 60-year militant and vicious persecution of the Catholic Church in Cuba. So, again, I don't want to suggest that the Pope supports political dictatorship, but he has, he has displayed a pattern of indulgence toward regimes to threaten political liberty and do so in the name of the poor. So it's interesting. So uh, he doesn't you... appear to be sensitive yeah. to the ideological co-optation of the poor. Millions upon millions of people were murdered, repressed, imprisoned in the 20th century in the name of the poor and the proletariat. So the gospel cannot be about an ideological appropriation of the poor. It's interesting, I mean, and I think this probably ties into maybe the Argentinian experience, but also the Jesuit experience in Latin America. That is to say, there is sort of a theology of the poor, a theology of the people, uh, has incarnate in Christ, I've read, and that, in effect, the, the poor become a way in which uh, one sees the church uh, almost exclusively. And, I, and I've wondered, so then when Pope Francis, if that's true, if he then thinks economically, when he thinks politically and socially, it's always through uh, this theology of the people and not necessarily reason, uh, tradition, history, taking all of these things into account. It, I think that's exactly right. Narrow, I think narrow. part of the problem is when the church adopted that slogan in the 60s that theological preferential, category or preference, preferential, option, preferential for option for the poor. Yeah. Again, there's a tension in Christian reflection on the poor. We see it in two of the Gospels where Jesus speaks 
separately of that blessed are the poor and blessed are the poor in spirit. So the category of the poor, the biblical category of the poor, cannot simply mean the poor is a socioeconomic category. It has to mean that openness or receptivity of those who have little to the grace and goodness of God. And the church, given the influence of the Aristotelian tradition via Thomism, was always sensitive to the fact that as a social and economic class or group, the poor can be rapacious and um, and uh, prone to demagoguery, they can be envious, uh, just as the rich can be oppressive and exploitative. So um, I think yeah. one of the problems that I've noted in some of my recent articles about Pope Francis has been his tendency to move back and forth from admirable Christian formulations that we want a church that is poor and open to the poor. And I don't think any faithful Catholic can quarrel with the spirit of those remarks. But then Pope Francis often elides that affirmation into a more ideological claim about the poor that I think is palpably false. Look at Venezuela today. Maduro following Chavez has impoverished the poor. He's wrecked the economy. He's wrecked the country. He threatens the church. He threatens fundamental freedoms. He's destroyed the bases of entrepreneurship and economic vitality in the country. The Venezuelan bishops have spoken out loudly and clearly. They even recently met with Pope Francis about this, but the Pope is silent. And I think the Pope is silent for a couple of reasons. One, he has unfortunate sympathies for a left-wing populism that misuses uh, the category of the poor in ideological ways. And two, coming out of the Argentinian and Peronist tradition, which is an authoritarian tradition of the left, he undervalues the intrinsic merit or goodness of political liberty. In that sense, I think Francis is actually taking a major step back from the Catholic Church's fulsome endorsement of political liberty, constitutional government, religious liberty, and liberal democracy. I think it's one of the achievements of the modern church that the church made its peace with liberal constitutionalism. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's a missed opportunity when the pope goes to Cuba, uh, has a cheerful four-hour meeting with Fidel Castro before he dies, and in the course of a several-day visit to Cuba, says nothing about the persecution of dissidents, says nothing about the systematic absence of law, and says nothing about the persecution of his own church. So um, you think so? I, those I, those I, categories, I, those yeah, those yeah. categories of liberal constitutionalism, uh, maybe I'm hearing you say, just I mean, they're just not really a part of the way this pope thinks about. Uh, politics. Uh, things no, about no, I mean, and just, um, they were, that's right. Yeah. And a concomitant uh, problem is again. That, I mean, in, in a way, right? That's I mean, and that's a very traditional. I say traditional. Uh, that's a deep leftist perspective. These these formal principles get in the way of redistributing wealth. They get in the way. I of think progress. that's right. You yeah. know, we go we go back to Karl Marx in the 1840s and 50s denouncing. British-style liberties as merely formal freedom. Real liberty, real freedom for Marx had nothing to do with the formal yeah. procedures or institutions or constraints and limits inherent in a, a liberal constitution. Yeah. Uh, I, do think, um, I do think the Pope also has a blind spot about communism. Uh, again, he's not communist. And he certainly would not endorse the mass violence and terror inherent in communist totalitarian regimes, ideological despotisms in the 20th century. On the other hand, he has repeatedly told uh, a friendly Italian left-wing journalists who interview him that communists are the true Christians of our time, that they've stolen the Christian flag on the poor, that communists had a major influence on him in Argentina in raising his conscious uh, 
consciousness about certain socioeconomic problems. All of that, by the way, is traced a little polemically in George Neumeier's new book, The Political Pope, which um, the tone is insufficiently measured, but the facts are quite revealing. Um, Cardinal Zen, the Cardinal Archbishop of Hong Kong, wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal four or five months ago where he noted that for Pope Francis, the only communists who are on his cognitive map are those who were persecuted by military governments in Argentina in the 1970s, either killed or roughed up or arrested during the dirty war against the armed left. While, you know, the communists who continue to repress millions of faithful Catholics in China, the communists who held the church captive in East Central Europe, the communists who, according to the Black the Book of Communism, which came out in France in 1998 and in the United States in 1999, communists who killed 100 million human beings in the terrible 20th century, these simply aren't part of his theological or political landscape. So in a way, and, I mean, in a way, it, it, it sounds like, I mean, this is, I'll be uncharitable. Um, it's like we have a, a, an incredibly provincial pope, intellectually. He is remarkably provincial. Um, look, I think um, he made no effort whatsoever to imbibe, to take into account the spiritual and political experiences of his predecessors, both who had encountered totalitarianism in its monstrous forms. Which is incredible. Pope Benedict with National Socialism, John Paul II with communism. I think the Pope is not only not so quietly undoing much of the best legacy of these two popes, but he shows an almost willful refusal to understand the world from their point of view. And, and I think that's another way of saying that is his viewpoint is remarkably provincial. It's Argentinian and... Uh, by the way, one could contrast another third world experience, Cardinal Robert Seurat, if one reads the book of interviews with him who came out a few years ago. He grew up in Equatorial Guinea, the Secutore regime that killed a million people, that persecuted the church. He had to fight this regime. He saw a egalitarian economic program that killed the poor, almost Pol Potish. In his recent book of interviews, Cardinal Seurat says the church, unlike Pope Francis, keeps on announcing we need more equal distribution of income. Um, um, uh, Cardinal Seurat says the church should not be doctrinaires of equality. Uh, what yeah. matters is that the poorest of the poor are provided for, that no one live in misery. That's a very different perspective. And... Um, yeah. So it's not so much that uh, Barholio is a third world perspective, but he's a third world perspective rooted in the specificities and even the pathologies of Argentine, Argentinian political culture since the 1930s. So thinking, thinking more about uh, his formal statements, I mean, you've, you've obviously read and studied those. You've written on them at length. What do you see in, in Pope Francis when he does talk about uh, economics when he does talk about you know politics that is in continuity with the Catholic social thought tradition starting with you know it's commonly thought to have started with Arrerum Novarum in 1891 put him because uh, you, know, you have you have put him in continuity in some respects uh, with that tradition even though he well, falls, yes. out, he falls mean, out in all uh, ways I mean the, the, the Catholic tradition of social, Catholic social teaching has been sub suspicious of excessive individualism and materialism. It's emphasized, um, um, it really arose out of an industrial age, and I think that teaching needs to be modernized, and Pope John Paul II tried to do that in his great 1991 yeah. uh, encyclical Santissimus which came to terms with the market economy and especially the dignity and necessity of entrepreneurship. Uh, let me begin with what's not in Francis, and then I'll move to what's in Francis. Uh, 
rarely does one have a statement of the importance of private property to the social and economic vitality of society and to human dignity. Uh, Pope Leo would place great emphasis on private property as in, being necessary to protect human liberty, yeah. to promote prosperity and justice, and for the sake of the moral virtues, a basic Aristotelian and Thomistic argument that one needs material goods to carry out the virtues, uh, generosity, liberality, um, charity. So uh, uh, I can find one or two grudging affirmations of the right of private property in Pope Francis. Occasionally, Pope Francis speaks about subsidiarity, uh, the idea that what can be done in a decentralized way by those social organisms, mechanisms closest to the phenomena ought to be done at that level. The family before local government, local government before regional government, regional government before centralized government. He has, he does somewhat ritualistically encant, as recent popes have done, about subsidiarity and solidarity, which seems to be the latest instantiation of the old Catholic notion of the common good. But if one reads the four or five encyclicals and apostolic letters, the enthusiasm lies in the solidarity direction, and there is a tendency um, you know, to wax poetic about things like a world political authority. True, true world now, political authority is, is the term he uses, the phrase he uses. What's that? True, true world political authority. That's and right. So, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, it was and by the too. way, you had it was some of that in Pope John the Twenty Third in Mater and Magistra, 19, uh, early 1960s. And he even had a little bit of that in uh, Pope Benedict's last uh, social encyclical Charity and Truth, although he was quite open about the despotic Nature. Uh, possibilities of a true world governing authority and the tensions between that and subsidiarity. And okay. I don't see the same thoughtfulness at work with uh, Francis. With Francis, one never, never, never sees a restatement of the church's um, age-old opposition to socialism and communism. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Pope Pius XI, the great theoretician of subsidiarity and quadrigestino anno, had famously stated in that great encyclical, no man can be a Catholic and a socialist at the same time. Yeah. No such statements from Francis. And when Francis is challenged in interviews, he'll always say, I'm just restating Catholic social teaching. But he's not. I would describe his restatement as a partial and distorting appropriation. Yeah. He leaves out rich parts of the tradition that are not um, yeah. amenable fly, to an <laughs> ideological reading of the preferential option for the poor. So could we could summarize, I mean, th there's no real defense of markets, uh, property, or criticisms of socialist utopianism uh, in, in his ma two major encyclicals that we have at this point. And, and it also seems to be the case, while he might nod towards subsidiarity, the overall thrust of what he's calling for, redistribution of wealth, the global order, uh, in the ways he thinks about economics and politics, there's no real work for for his conception of subsidiarity. Well, his idea yeah. of a, of centralizing redistribution of state would be completely destructive of uh, subsidiarity within its own sphere. Uh, no, one one can't. Uh, 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 so so there's a rhetorical, there's an occasional rhetorical nod to subsidiarity. But the logic of his own proposals and mentality go against subsidiarity in pretty fundamental ways. It seems. And, and the failure to condemn socialism uh, 
is any complete silence about the fundamental insights about entrepreneurship and co-creation and the market economy and centesimus annus of John Paul II, quite remarkable. He yeah. just proceeds as if that pontificate never existed. Well, no, but it's interesting, too, in this regard that no no real defense. So you think about the first encyclical, there is a defense of property, there's there's a defense of family, there's a defense of um, what we, might, we, we kind of think of as you know, the civil society institutions, uh, as these things all being uh, necessary to make a dignified uh, political order work. Uh, not only do we not get a defense of those, but he seems to really speak in criticism of of markets in the West. Uh, he's been incredibly critical of you know global economics and globalization. Not that it's we should unqualifiedly praise uh, all of the developments that have happened, but the ways in which he condemns it, and his blindness to to my mind of the ways in which you know hundreds of millions of people have been lifted out of poverty in the last thirty years um, uh, in, in certain parts of the world, and no, no attempt to address that at all. No, in fact, um, I would say for, if you read Laudato Si, capitalist progress is identified with the accumulation of what the Pope calls debris, debris desolation, and filth. One of the things that struck me as being mo most deeply pro problematic, and there were many deeply problematic things about Laudato Si, was that Yes, the Pope ignores the considerable progress made on ecological issues in self-governing uh, democracies uh, that are responsive to public opinion, where technology innovates, where the market can address ongoing social and economic difficulties and ecological difficulties. George Wills says, talks about the, uh, you know, just come, look at the, the, the Thames River in London 50 or 60 years ago. You know, England is a much less polluted country. And, and the Pope is completely silent about the record of the ecological and environmental record uh, in, in countries that experienced really existing socialism. Uh, yeah. The Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, Poland today China. These are countries that have experienced pollution in a calamitous way, but the assumption that capitalism is the source of environmental degradation and provides no means for the correction of the problem, I think it's just empirically false. Well, but also and, it's, it, there's a certain amount of wealth that societies reach uh, that affords them the luxury to really care about their environment. That's right. And, and in that's such a way right. that's, that will the reduce other, economic The other growth. issue that's worth noting is the, um, the strange bedfellows that the Pope now associates with. You know, the, con the, the Vatican had a, con a conference oh, yeah. Yeah. upon the publication of Laudato Si, and they invited somebody named J John Schellnhuber, uh, a German scientist who has for draconian population control, who has publicly stated that the Earth can reasonably hold and sustain no more than one billion people, and that uh, <laughs> governments need to act to reduce dramatically the world's population. Well, of course, this would entail an uh, a coercive policy of monstrous and murderous intensity, it's also at odds with Catholic teaching about contraception and abortion. Recently, the Vatican brought Paul Ehrlich, who was so wrong, we remember, oh, in the my, 1970s yes. when he predicted, He's wrong about like everything. the Club of Rome report, that the world would run out of resources by the year 2000. So the scientists that the Vatican is drawing on, associating with, are profoundly anti-Catholic, profoundly anti-human, and just wrong, repeatedly wrong, when it comes to their uh, ap apocalyptic predictions about the future of the Earth and its resources. So in a way, I mean, it's almost like Pope Francis uh, at times, particularly these public comments, these sort of off-the-cuff remarks and some of these addresses and speeches, it's almost as if he's like knowingly, willingly trafficking in the secular pieties of the West. I mean, he wants to be that kind of a celebrity. I think it's very true, and I also think it's very true that he is blind, utterly blind, uh, 
to the way that environmentalism has become, uh, and here I'm clearly differentiating a prudent and morally serious effort to be stewards and caretakers of the environment. His predecessors encouraged it, and his successors ought to encourage it. There is absolutely nothing wrong with an enhanced ecological consciousness, and one can argue for that on eminently Christian and even conservative grounds. Uh, The problem is the failure to see that environmentalism has become a secular religion, Mm -hmm. that worship of the earth has replaced worship of the transcendent creator God, that um, a kind of apocalyptic furor and a disdain for evidence informs um, the Paul Ehrlichs and Schumburners of the world who are uh, um, absolutely convinced that we're at the end times. And many of them, in fact, blame it on Christianity, going back to Lynn White's article in Science Magazine in 1967, which said it was the... uh, the book of Genesis with its idea that human beings had a dominion on the earth, which is the source of all ecological devastation. So the church is is um, identifying itself with a movement that is pantheistic, that is apocalyptic, that shows a certain disdain for empirical evidence, and, that and doing it in the name of some kind of strange development of doctrine. Yeah, and you make the point in your in your, in your paper, Pope Francis's humanitarian version of Catholic wisdom, uh, that this sort of fear of any pollution, fear to use the earth in any way uh, for human beings, actually, you know, hurts the poor tremendously. They, they are the ones in need of economic growth. Well, that's right. I mean, the logic of this would point to a wholly deindustrialized society. This is the problem with the Greens in Europe. Uh, These are upper-middle-class people who want to sustain prosperity made possible by a social market economy and a culture of entrepreneurship. But if um, our goal is simply to preserve every existing species, our our goal is to de-industrialize society, it's very hard to see how one can promote those ends and take care of the poor. And capitalism, as Michael Novak and others pointed out, has been the major vehicle for lifting the poor out of poverty. And I think an aggressive, inveterate, anti-capitalist rhetoric. You know, the tendency to blame problems inherent in science and modernity and the conquest of nature simply on capitalism. Capitalism has displayed certain capacity for self-correction totally absent in centralized socialism, particularly of the totalitarian and collectivist sort. And again, I think the Pope's predecessors, because they had some experience of 20th century totalitarianism, were much more sensitive to this. Yeah. And, and we come back, I think, to the, the provinciality of the present Pope. Well, interesting, too, in this regard. You note in your papers, so here, you know, here he is, he's in Rome, Italy, we have the European Union uh, and, and the ways in which it exercises power. Now, of course, it's been long-standing Vatican policy to support the European Union, to unite the European continent. Uh, and yet you know no defense, not a hint of a defense of the nation-state. And yet the appeals to true world political authority, direct quote. And, and also, I think recent, earlier this week, uh, Pope Francis said uh, Europe must you know, proceed under the guise of the European Union if it is to have any future at all. Uh, and but, and but no failure to note, failure to note any of the problems of the European Union. Look, I, uh, I, I'll be very frank. I think Pope Francis is the first Roman pontiff who really doesn't care all that much about Europe. He, um, he, he uh, uh, has repeatedly said that he does not like people to refer to the Christian roots or Christian mark of Europe because it, it has an air of neocolonialism about it. He's in favor of limitless and open immigration, which, if demographic trends continue, uh, 
will transform Europe into a Muslim continent in 50 to 75 years. He is completely blind to what's entailed in that. When it comes to politics, one of his better speeches was his speech a couple of years ago at the European Parliament. And in the article you cited, I do analyze it at some length and mainly sympathetically. But I know it is not good enough to say Europe must be faithful to our traditions and must be plural and must have variety. That variety has to take the form of self-governing nations. Mm-hmm. And one can envision a European project built on the pillar of the nations. De Gaulle certainly envisioned it in the 1950s and 60s. And by the way, Catholic Poland wants to remain Poland. It doesn't want to be swallowed up by an EU project, by the bureaucrats and the commissioners in Brussels who are deeply opposed to a Catholic vision of the human person. This is one of the great mysteries, why the Vatican supports a kind of globalization and international institutions from the UN to the EU that are openly, militantly, aggressively anti-Catholic. Uh, some pe- some of us may remember Rocco Bertiglioni, the great uh, Italian philosopher and politician who was very close to John Paul II, when he was nominated by the Italian government to be a European commissioner. He was vetoed, even though there were six ex-communist commissioners, was fined to be an ex-Marxist-Leninist at, ser- at the service of a totalitarian regime. But if you thought abortion was a sin... You couldn't serve as a European commissioner. So this is the Europe. This is the UN that the Pope endorses as somehow necessary to the enfolding of of a properly Catholic political vision. It, 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 It frankly is a position at odds with itself. It's been a... Why the enthusiasm for organizations that are defined by a non-negotiable anti-Catholicism. It's interesting here, I mean, just hearing you talk about this, the Pope uh, and Islam, uh, his, his comments on Islam, his, you know, the times in which he's written about Islam, uh, also seems to be remarkably deaf or, you know, just r- really not seeing the problems that are presented uh, with, with the migrations to Europe or any of the problems. And, and just in, in, in general, I, I think, too, is this sort of more of an example of his provincialism, that he now faces this problem of Islam, which you know he probably did not face in the same way in Argentina, and he automatically defers to sort of the politically correct wisdom in, in dealing with it. You, you quote him as saying, um, quote, authentic Islam and the proper reading of the Quran are opposed to every form of violence, end quote. Uh, that is a statement almost laughable. Yeah, it's a lie. Uh, I mean, one has to be frank. It's a lie. It's a big lie. It's a Stalinist lie. Um, you know, the best one can argue is that during the Medina period, before Muhammad took control as a warrior statesman, he called for peace and negotiations with Christians and Jews. In the Meccan period, when he was in charge, he murdered the Jews at Medina, he declared holy war on the enemies of Islam. The Koran is filled with scurrilous and violent, encouraging words against Christians and Jews. It is another lie to argue, as some in the Vatican do, that jihad simply refers to self-overcoming. The Muslim tradition has always recognized jihad, holy war of the sword, to be an essential and high manifestation of jihad or struggle in the Koran and in the Islamic tradition. So, um, and the uh, the Pope also, unfortunately, relativizes murder and fanaticism among political Islamists by saying, and he's done this 300 times at least in various discourses and speeches and press conferences, that every religion has its violent fundamentalism. Yes. You yes. know, people well, around is, the Pope PC, now that's a compare PC. evangelical yeah. Christians to fundamentalists in Islam. Yeah. 
He's and a, again, well, you you've these, got him. He quotes. He says Catholic violence is is just yes. as marked as Islamic violence, which is ridiculous. Um, yeah, I uh, it, I think he, in my yeah. article I give an example when the Pope was coming back um, from World Youth from Day. Warsaw from the World Youth Congress last summer. Uh, he gave one of his unfortunate press conferences. Unfortunate because he shoots from the hips and says things at odds with the faith. But um, Francis said, well, there's as much Catholic violence as Islamic violence. And this is right after the, the horrific bludgeoning, bludgeoning and murder of, po of Father Jacques Hamel in his little country church in Normandy in June 2016. When the Pope was asked by shock journalists uh, uh, what he meant, he said that he had read in the Italian newspapers about a 19-year-old boy who had killed his 18-year-old girlfriend, a crime of passion, and that they must have been baptized Catholics. So to compare ordinary human frailty, a crime of passion, a lover's quarrel between two people who possibly may have been baptized with those who kill in the name of Allah who persecute Christians, who behead Egyptian cops, who declare war uh, on uh, anything that gets in the way of the caliphate and the political imposition of Sharia. It's silly. It's, it's risible. And I'm afraid to say it's the kind of utterance that makes people lose respect for the person of the pope. Um, there is no Catholic violence loosed upon the world. And to say there is can only be justified in the name of an intellectually dishonest moral equivalence and political correctness. So when he's speaking about the Koran as forbidding all violence, when he's speaking about Catholic violence, he is seeing the world through lenses that ideological lenses that fundamentally distort. And I would say this is the worst of Pope Francis. Well, it's interesting uh, too. I mean, he's also attributed, which is a standard leftist move, uh, Islamic terror and violence to uh, economic injustice uh, and Western colonialism of the Middle East. You got, you got to speak up again. I'm sorry. You know, he has also attributed you know, Islamic violence to economic injustice. Yeah, by the way, the Pope is very enamored of paramarxist explanations of war and violence. Uh, he refuses to posit the religious sources of Islamism and Islamic terrorism. He constantly, uh, a Raymond, someone like Raymond Aron would be flabbergasted by his uh, views that all wars are called by capitalists and gun merchants and this kind of thing. As Aron pointed out many years ago, capitalists don't want wars. They want to make money peacefully. Yes. Uh, governments are much more likely to want wars for wholly non-economic reasons. But the Pope speaks with great assuredness about matters about, what he, about which he knows nothing. And he's bought, and again, he's not a Marxist. He doesn't favor regimes of terror, but he is bought into a para-Marxist and economically reductionist vulgate. That is, the, the tools of his analysis are that. That's right. So, yes. Yeah. So it, thinking about, I mean, bringing, bringing our discussion here to an end, uh, <laughs> so, so we're ending on a rather, uh, we, we've been fairly critical of the Pope uh, overall in this interview. Um, uh, how do you see him, or, or do you see him uh, really changing the church overall? I mean, he's 80 years old. He could continue uh, in the papacy for some time yet. Uh, do, you, do you see this legacy being one that's long-lasting, or is sort of the, the, what we've been discussing sort of the provinciality of his intellect and the ways, the clumsy ways in which he analyzes political and social phenomena, something that will pass away? I'm not sure. Certainly his Episcopal appointments to point people who, um, you know, who um, are 
uh, enamored of left-wing social justice and income redistribution, who downplay the life issues, who uh, share a certain animus against um, uh, against the Western democracies, is going to have some effect on the character of the Episcopate. On the other hand, my feeling is that some liberal bishops, even in Western Europe, fear that the Pope has gone too far, has been too heavy-handed, and is leading the church towards schism, a kind of quiet schism, an unofficial schism. So I think the next pope may share some of, uh, of, of Pope Francis's views, but will do so in a more modulated way, in a way that's more respectful to conservatives in the church, that is less summary in its views about Western democracy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I will say this. There has been no Francis effect in terms of people coming back to the church. No, Many people point. have noted that those who are most enthusiastic about Francis are ex-Catholics or anti-Catholics or non-Catholics of various sorts, people who are and who will remain outside of the church. Um, that um, there's certainly you know, been no. I mean, we were, you know, if we think about, you know, a promised uh, bump in vocations due to this sort of belief that well, young people will automatically be attracted to Pope Francis's vision. The people that I've talked to, and I think of our good friend Paul Seaton at St. Mary's Seminary in Baltimore, none of that's really been seen. Uh, no, or true at all. Yeah. And by the way, Pope Francis conveys a message. He told his Italian interlocutor, the left-wing uh, uh, reporter for La Pubblica, he always interviews with, that uh, he's against conversion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I read uh, Everyone should just follow their own conscience, which he seems to understand in a subjectivist way. I mean, if the church no longer has a real place for the Great Commission to go forth among the nations, and and to bring people to God in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, then you have to wonder if the church simply isn't in danger of becoming a uh, humanitarian NGO. And um, so I don't well, know what the it. long uh, term effects of this papacy will be. I suspect confusion. Yeah. I yeah. suspect an undermining of the ordinary magisterium of the church. I think even of his admirers recognize that many of his socioeconomic views are extreme, uncalibrated, uh, filled with a kind of uh, unthinking animus against the achievements of Western liberal societies. Um, but on the other hand, this pope has done something his predecessors, Benedict and John Paul II, did not do. He has purged people he doesn't like from every level of the church. Yeah. Uh, and um, and uh, and so his um, he's going to have an effect on the church. But um, I have some hope that the church leadership and the College of Cardinals will learn some lessons from things that have been poorly done, things that are not in accord with the uh, the full teachings of the church, and they'll back off a bit. But it's it's hard to tell, and of course I'm not a prophet, but one can only guess about these things. Yeah. No. Well, Dan Mahoney, thank you so much for your time uh, today in discussing the social, political, economic, and religious thought of Pope Francis. It's been a great discussion. My pleasure. Thank you, Richard. This is your host, Richard Reinch, and you have been listening to a podcast that can be found at libertylawsite.org, where you can subscribe, comment, and find other episodes and links related to today's conversation. Our email address is lal at libertyfund.org.